issues of facilitation, how do you convene, etc., are clearly important. Deliberation doesn't mean everyone's going to agree suddenly and there's going to be wonderful consensus. But it should help understand, increase mutual understanding. At least we know where we agree on and what we don't agree on, our interpretations of the evidence. Think about policy integration. This is obviously one of the challenges in adaptation to climate change. You know, you're trying to pursue sustainable development, but if left alone, bureaucracies invariably fragment along ministerial lines. Each one will come up with their own climate change adaptation strategy. Networks can help a little bit. You, you these cross-ministerial networks, sometimes they're ad hoc, etc. Maybe they're convened by a third party. They can start to um, build that coordination cooperation needed in strategic planning. But often you're going to have to need more formalized and institutionalized things to get things going. This might be special committees, but in new problem areas like climate change, it may need to be even more flexible arenas. It might be panels, dialogues, consultations, where real deliberation with people from different agencies can take place. Dialogues are one example of deliberative engagement. And these are ideas of creating and supporting spaces for meaningful con con conversations where you can explore alternatives. This can help reduce conflicts. Maybe it can inform negotiations and decisions. Multi-stakeholder dialogues tend to bring in a lot of different perspectives and on needs, impacts, options, causes, and of course, that, you know, it's not easy to sort out who's right or wrong, but at least it gets the conversations going. Over the last decade in the Asia-Pacific region, there's been many dialogues about water resources, about water resource infrastructure, resource development programs, and many different levels. Some of them are at very small levels, and in local watershed and within RBO, river basin organizations, etc., and some at the kind of international level, like at the Mekong level. They vary hugely. Some of them have, are really ineffective, have no influence. Others have quite a lot. And that's one of the kind of practical questions is how do you create and sustain high quality deliberative processes? What we've learned from comparative studies and, and actually some learning by doing and being conveners, etc., is that who is invited, how are they facilitated, and, and, and what is allowed on the agenda. These are some of the things that make a big difference to the quality of deliberative things. Deliberative things are important because they enable social learning, you know, that learning with others, not just reading a book. Huh? Social learning helps groups deal with informational uncertainties. Other people know things that you don't know. But they also help deal with normative uncertainties. They have different sets of values and beliefs. They have different sets of interests, different sets of priorities. And at least you can understand those. It doesn't mean you agree on them. It can also empower stakeholders to actually take actions. If they can collaborate, coordinate, and they can actually go ahead and do it. Um, Reduce conflicts and, and you know, and they, I guess the aim is to actually improve fairness overall. So these re reasons, that deliberative dimension of governance is also important for adaptation. Adaptive and deliberative processes may still be exclusive. You know, who sits at the table, who who's, who's actually has influence on the agenda, who has influence on what, on what turns into policy, what turns into practice. Inclusiveness may be the only way to ensure that the interests and needs of marginalized and socially vulnerable groups are not ignored. Fair adaptation to climate change, I put it to you, depends quite a lot on inclusiveness. A core objective adaptation should be empowerment. Investments and assistance should expand choices. Marginalized groups need social, economic, and political space in which to exercise and their expertise and their rights to adapt. Inclusiveness does not immediately or completely address power imbalances, huh? but it's a good place to start. Sometimes capacities to engage, to understand, may need to be built and even supported. Huh? The Mekong River drains territory in six countries. One of the tasks created by the 1995 Mekong Agreement between the four lower basin countries was that they had to, to prepare a basin development plan, or the BDP as they called it. The first phase, which started in 2002, national governments, governments were referred to as the primary stakeholders by calling them the internal stakeholders. Non-government state actors, local communities, businesses, etc., were called external. The process was quite deliberative. Government officials, selected investors, multilateral banks, exchanged data, met, but it was clearly not inclusive. As a consequence, the activities under the BDP were frequently criticized by civil society in this, in this region for lack of transparency, 
uh, no meaningful participation, and just ineffectiveness in guiding what the individual governments were doing. I mean, they just ignore whatever this regional body came up with. Over time, this has changed a bit. Um, much greater emphasis on stakeholder consultations. I think MSCs now run three public stakeholder in consultations on the BDP plan, so there's opportunities in arenas that they have already organized for, for, for NGOs, for different stakeholders to express their views. Many of the inputs on in these forums from non-state actors have been highly critical of the neglect of the adverse impacts of large-scale infrastructure, especially mainstream dams on fisheries, wetlands, and livelihoods of the poor. Of course, being able to say those things in a meeting and, and to actually have an impact on, on the planning process can be very different things. Uh, as the people who have been watching the news would know, just end of last week, the MRC released the draft findings of the Strategic Environmental Assessment Report. And one of the interesting conclusions of that uh, panel of experts is says is there's a lot of things we don't know enough about, about cumulative aggregate impacts, and that we should wait another, we should do another 10 years of careful study before we charge off onto mainstream dams. That's a very different message than BDP has put out which says basically go for it. So it's interesting. Huh? Deliberative processes help, but they're not, a, they're not, a necessarily, not, a, not necessarily everyone in power listens. Huh? At smaller scales, the issue of inclusiveness also rises. Policies and measures to protect watershed services or forests, for example, that exclude traditional users or local farmers could make them much more vulnerable to climate change and, of course, other things, commodity price changes, etc. Gender is another crucial and often overlooked dimension of integration of adaptation policies in planning, disaster management. Representation of women in Thailand and local government is very, very low. If you look at, in water user associations, there's hardly any women present. If you look at disaster committees, it's a bit better, but also quite low, and usually confined to supporting rather than decision-making roles. From my, our analysis we've done over the last few years on flood disaster risk management, we've shown that quite a lot of things that are called risk reduction are really about risk redistribution. If you think about the actions taken to protect CBDs, to protect capitals, and where the water goes instead, yeah, to farmers' fields, villages, etc., and whether or not there's actually adequate compensation schemes in place, often there is not. Huh? So there's an important element here of, you know, in, in all these analyses, I think it's, you get the same message, is that if you exclude people from planning, processes from the governance of decision making important to their adaptation their interests and capabilities are unlikely to be taken into account it's true at many levels it doesn't matter whether you're talking about international negotiations on a shared river basin or you're talking about the climate change negotiation about who is responsible for high co2 and who should pay for adaptation and whether you're talking about management of local water resources shared by irrigators, etc. In all these cases, if you exclude people, it's pretty unlikely their interests will be adequately presented. So adaptive governance, the adaptive bit is not enough. Inclusiveness also matters. So I, I'm getting near the end, and you know, one of the things I wanted to ca have a caveat, but I don't have a caveat slide, but my claims about the importance of being inclusive, deliberative, ad adaptive, are not meant to be blanket claims for policy and planning. I don't want to pretend you need those three all the time. So maybe this is the key thing, you know, really, when does it m not matter very much to be inclusive, deliberative, and, ad and adaptive? And I've tried to think about that. When does it not that important to be adaptive? Obviously, if you're pretty talking about things that are very certain, quite deterministic, low chance of unanticipated surprises, or if they happen, they're unlikely to have much consequence or impact. Adaptive may not be so important in those situations. How about inclusive? When does inclusiveness not matter so much? And I put it to you, it's when you're talking about a, an issue that's primarily confined to a single stakeholder group. When the cross-sectoral effects are small, then becoming multi-stakeholder participatory is not as important as in other problem situations. When does deliberative dimension not as important? Well, when understanding is very high, when knowledge claims are not contested very much. Everyone just agrees. Yes, that's the explanation for causes. That's the options. Clearly, the deliberative process is not so important. But I put it to you that pursuing adaptation to climate change is not one of those types of problems. No? Some other ones are, but climate change is not. Here we're talking about adaptation to climate change in the context of many other confounding environmental and development changes. And it's an inherently political process. Maybe this is what I can add to, to Darren's message, which is a little bit more about policy making. But it's also policy making is a political process. And it requires more than just getting the right policies, 
or experts in place. How adaptation is governed matters for success. 